Um, now, an ongoing uh, issue pertinent to a lot of the UK, but more specifically to Scotland, is the general absence of more Iron Age burials. Now, the majority of this audience could easily name one of the many Bronze Age burials uh, known from around Scotland, and we've already heard about quite a few this morning, uh, uh, such as the cemetery at Kilmartin, the Neolithic chamber cairns found in Caithness and Orkney, and perhaps even some of the more famous Pictish barrow sites, such as Garbeg or Meagol. And to add to that, we have lots of evidence for long kiss cemeteries as well. But few could name any of the Iron Age examples we know from Scotland. And this is perhaps more pertinent when we consider the settlement patterns in Scotland. The Iron Age is famous for really large stone-built structures, such as brocks and wheelhouses, as well as dunes and forts. Uh, basically, really prominent constructions. Um, so why are there so few burials? Why can't we find anything like this? Now, this absence was made more apparent in Winster's 1981 publication, um, Burial Practices in Iron Age Britain, which noted as few as 24 Scottish Iron Age burials. And it was then generally accepted that the reasons for such a small data set relate to the fact that during this period, the funerary rites used in the majority of circumstances would leave no obvious trace. I'm talking about excarnation, cremation, and perhaps deposits in watery contents. While this was generally accepted that, funer that these funerary rites existed, it was also suggested within the literature and through analogy with European contexts that many more exist in other forms and it was simply that we are not recognising them. This includes things like the head cults in Europe and the deposition of human remains in buildings and across settlement. And one of the main reasons for this is of course that there's no diagnostic Iron Age burial or associated grave good recognised at that point. So we have, have for example, uh, burial types in the Bronze Age, we heard about uh, beaker burials, food vessel uh, burials, urn cremations. And in the later Christian period, we have extended inhumations about uh, grave goods. We don't have some, anything similar in the Iron Age. So just to demonstrate, uh, both burials were identified in the West Isles. The one on the left is a Bronze Age burial from a Bronze Age cemetery. I apologize for the, the photograph that was taken in December in very poor conditions. And the one on the left is uh, also excavated in the West Isles, and that's an Iron Age burial. And I hope you can see the uh, heterogeneous nature of them. Both garbled kists, single inhumations on their side, uh, no grave goods. Um, without uh, real, uh, real carbon dating, you, you wouldn't be able to tell these two apart. And similarly, these two inhumations which were uh, excavated in one in the West Isles on the left, and one in a uh, Pictish cemetery on the right. And um, there's no real difference between either of them, um, apart from the dates. Again, this was picked up through the radiocarbon dating. Apprehension to identify Iron Age burials has been accounted to the fact that there's a general similarity between the funerary rites of the Bronze Age right through to the early historic period. And a large amount of burials are simply recorded in the record in Canmore, for example, as kists with no specific attributed date. Now, a further problem associated with the identification of Iron Age burials comes with the reason for discovery. In contrast to some of the Bronze Age burials, there are a few surviving overland cairns or mines or grave markers, suggesting that if they did exist, they may have been more temporary or small. And in addition, recent work on larger longest cemeteries such as Hallow Hill and Lockhead Quarry has identified earlier late Iron Age burials that simply won't be picked up without radiocarbon dating and without uh, much more uh, analysis. So since Wimster's original publication, much work has been completed on Iron Age burials and funerary rites in Scotland. And this has been demonstrated in the last few years, for example, the First Millennia Studies Group uh, lecture series this year on Iron Age burials, the day conference they held on ritual in 2009, and fourth pump, uh, coming publication of the Dunbar Warrior Burial by AOC, but more generally in synthesis by Dennis Harding, Ian Ralston and Ian Armit. Now perhaps more importantly, a series of developments in the wider archaeological sector has brought about further change, and this includes developments in radiocarbon dating. We can now date very small pieces of cremated bone, which we couldn't do at, you know, at a much earlier period in the 80s. <coughs> Uh, and this has been emphasised by the radiocarbon date programme of the National Museums of Scotland, which identified a few Iron Age burials. Uh, artifactual analysis of existing uh, graves and grave goods, reanalysis of existing material and assemblage has both, both added and removed some of the more contentious examples. 
For example, the graves at Cairn Papal, which were long thought to be Iron Age, the outlying ones, uh, we now know to be much later, while new evidence for Iron Age burials has been identified in uh, Fife by Fraser Hunter, who relooked at some of the finds. Contractor-led archaeology aligned with much more thorough sampling strategies, and in particular the Historic Scotland Human Remains Call of Contract, um, this has proved hugely successful. In a five-year period in which AOC Archaeology managed the Human Remains Call of Contract, of 32 burials uh, identified, seven were Iron Age, eight were Bronze Age, and 11 were Early Historic, so a good mix of burials, but it just shows that we are, there are Iron Age burials yet to be discovered. Uh, publication of earlier excavations, Hallow Hill and Dryburn Bridge, and to add to that, Rocksmith, they've, they've all um, identified Iron Age burials, and of course, post-grad research and rescue excavation. Now, these developments have helped demonstrate the wide variety of Iron Age burials in Scotland, which include, uh, I won't read that list, I hope you can all see that, but there's a far bigger um, data set now than was previously thought. We now know of approximately 123 sites, of which 52 have been radiocarbon dated. However, it's not my intention to talk about uh, uh, the Scottish record completely, but simply just to outline new examples of Iron Age burials in the West Isles, resulting from AOC archaeology's tenure of the Historic Scotland Human Remains Call of Contract in the years mentioned. So the illustration of, uh, here demonstrates that Winster's original study, uh, many new examples have been recorded, although many of these are simply older assemblages that have been reinterpreted. I the illustration shows a general bias towards the central belt where the majority of modern development takes place. There's no avoiding the fact that some of these burials will be identified in large uh, root schemes, for example, housing developments. But also in the northern and western isles, the distribution of uh, this can partially accounted to for antiquarian interest in, for example, uh, the larger stone settlement sites, uh, such as Brocks and wheelhouses, in which human remains were deposited in contexts such as entrances uh, and under floors. And these have been ana analysed by Fiona Tucker in her PhD, so will not really be considered here. However, the more recent examples can be attributed to their exposure through coastal erosion. Although this is not a new problem, it's certainly an increasing problem, with the west coast of Scotland in particular being subject to severe and intense storm damage as a result of, of course, global warming and the like. Now this increase is reflected in such organisations as Escape Trust, who specialise in investigating coastal archaeology uh, exposed by coastal erosion, but equally in the human remains call of contract, which recovers human remains specifically. So between 2004 and 2008, AOC excavated 13 examples of human remains in the Northern and West Isles, and the four I'm, I'm going to talk to you today were exposed on the coasts of Harris and the Eurists. Uh, at Scarista, the excavation of human remains identified a, a eroding from a northwest face of a large sand dune complex, recovered fragmentary and disarticulated skeletal remains of a single juvenile aged between seven and nine years old. The remains comprised incomplete legs, torso remains, and were aligned east-northeast to west-southwest. The presence of a few cobbles in close proximity um, suggested that there had been some sort of kiss structure around this. Uh, only 40% of the body survived, and this emphasises the, what we're saying about coastal erosion and the like. A radiocarbon date uh, was calibrated between 60 and 320 AD for this burial. Uh, the excavation of a single extended inhumation burial, uh, placed on its back and aligned, uh, aligned southeast to northwest, with its head at the southeast at the valley. Um, the arms were extended. Uh, the side of the body and the legs were extended and uncrossed. There was no obvious kist for this one, although there was a couple of stones at the bottom. Um, a relatively high percentage of this skeleton uh, survived, and that was 65%. Now, a radiocarbon date recovered from, again, the bone, dated to 390 to 200 BC. At Drummersdale, the excavation of a single short kist revealed a fully articulated skeleton of an adult male between 26 and 35 years old. The burial conformed broadly to the tradition of single crouched inhumations with the head pointing northwest and the body positioned on its left side. However, the knees were bent vertically upwards rather than remaining level with the body and the bones had bleached and weathered where erosion had caused them to project above the sand. The kist appeared ill-suited to the size of the skeleton being neither as broad as might be expected of a short case built to accommodate a crouched burial, 
but neither as long as a later long history. Now, this survived, 90% of this body survived, and uh, another Iron Age date was uh, received for this, 250 to 410 AD. Now, the final burial we analysed here was a single northeast to southwest aligned crouched inhumation recorded within, again, a short kist. The body had been placed in a crouched position on its right side, with the feet positioned together and one leg lying on top of the other. The grave cut was cut into a midden, so there's earlier activity there, in an erosion phase, and the stones of the kist were positioned very tightly around the cut. The remains were of an adult individual aged between 26 and 35 years of age, and the surviving bones indicated that it was a male. Um, and 50% of this body survived. So what have we learned from this work? In the last 30 years since Winster's original work, we have been able to increase the data set by at least 50%, but more likely this figure can be quadrupled. Iron Age burials are, uh, are far more common than we thought uh, in, in the early 1980s. However, the data set is still too small to observe <coughs> real regional or national patterns. And previously, regional patterns were uh, recognised, and these include things like corbel kiss identified in East Lothian and discussed by, mother, uh, by among others, Strathalde and then Anne Crone in the North Belton publication. There's a possibility of child burials being subject to special treatment, such as the burials at Kusi Cave in Murrayshire, in which disarticulated child jawbones were identified, or the disarticulated body of a teenage boy buried in a series of pits under the wheelhouse at Ornish Point in the U.S. Multiple inhumations have been identified in the central belt, such as Morden in Edinburgh and Loch End in Dunbar. And finally, there is the, a more recent development, possible warrior burials identified, among others, Alloa and Dunbar. As with the national records, the evidence of the West Niles is too sparse to suggest any concrete and specific patterns. Uh, however, while the, the burials were generally extremely truncated, it is possible to suggest a very general uh, pattern and try and fit them in. So all four burials are likely to have been buried within at least a grave pit, but more likely a stone kist. On a national level, this is by far the most common form of burial in the Iron Age, um, and is recognised from the West Niles to the Central Belt. In total, 54 examples have been identified, and this comprises 35 in Eastern Scotland, 17 in the Atlantic area, and a single one in Southwest Scotland. There seems to be no recurring or favoured position of alignment. All three, although three were crouched, uh, only, and the other one was in an extending position, a, a mix really. All four were single burials, and they did not contain multiple inhumations. And as with the national record, there seems to be no preference for who is being buried. There's male and female present, and there's children and adult. And similarly, we have no grave goods. So what does the group tell us generally? The four inhumation burials recorded during the present work represent a significant addition to the corpus of known Iron Age inhumation burial sites in the West Niles and in Scotland generally. The excavations have demonstrated perhaps the normality of some Iron Age burials in the West Niles that is often overlooked. Some of the most famous Iron Age burials have been described as richly charged. The mutilated boy at Hornish Point and the disarticulated skulls found at Beerybrook, for example, among others. So while it's clear that the Iron Age was witness to some very specific rituals, we should not overlook the almost mundane nature of some of these burials in search for more examples. The excavation of all four sites has demonstrated the importance of both the human remains call of contract in understanding the Scottish burial record as a whole, but also the importance of radiocarbon dating. <coughs> Without absolute dating and in the absence of associated grave goods, these burials are likely to have been ascribed a Bronze Age date. And this demonstrates the importance of comprehensive dating. Perhaps more pertinently, the recovery of the burials demonstrates the, the redevelopment of rescue archaeology in Scotland. As the threat of coastal erosion increases, the archaeology of Scotland is under threat more than ever, and we cannot let these opportunities for new research go to waste. Um, again, just to say, all, every, all this material was paid for uh, by Historic Scotland. Okay, thank you. <laughs>